Today, I have not one, but two special guests who have written an amazing new book. You can see all the post-its, how good it is. It's called Body on Fire, How Inflammation Triggers Chronic Illness and the Tools We Have to Fight It. Their names are Dr. Monica Agarwal and Dr. Jyothi Rao. And they're going to talk about their book and what brought them to write this book and maybe their stories too. So let's welcome both of them to the show. Thank you, doctor, so much for being here and congratulations on, on having a book and, and being such an excellent book as well. Oh, thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much for having us. It is my pleasure. Just try to speak a little bit louder so that the Zoom triggers you so, uh, when, when you okay. talk. So, you know, I, this book was actually recommended to me by your publisher because it, said it was doing really well and I had to bump everybody up and get you guys on the show to talk about it. So what got you interested in writing a book on inflammation and, and really what is inflammation? Monica. Okay, so um, inflammation, so Jyothi and I are looking at each other like, am I supposed to take this one? <laughs> okay, so just so. You know, inflammation, um, I always think of inflammation and describe inflammation as your body's mad at you. Um, it's when your body's irritation. And so whatever irritates you and, and it irritates the body will manifest ultimately an infl inflammation in the body. And then eventually with long-term inflammation can cause chronic illness. So for instance, some of the things that trigger inflammation are stress, which is one of the biggest one, especially, and stress can manifest itself in many forms. It could be uh, social stress, which is what most people think of when they think of stress as sort of life stress, like work stress, or I had a really bad day at work, that kind of stuff. But stress can also manifest as sort of lack of activity or a sedentary lifestyle or poor diet, putting the wrong foods in your mouth or noise pollution, sun pollution. And so all that stuff can sort of trigger um, uh, inflammation in your body, which then sort of becomes a trigger for um, uh, illness. You ask the second question you asked is how do we get into this? Um, and Jyothi always tells the story maybe better than I do of how we started writing this book. I can tell you the background is um, that I, um, you know, it's funny because I actually for years had a lot of trouble talking about it, but I have a chronic illness. And so I have, um, uh, advanced rheumatoid arthritis. And I was told when I was diagnosed after I had my third little munchkin, who's sitting right here. Um, <laughs> and that little munchkin, when she was born, um, after about four months of, of um, nursing, running around like a fool and being a full-time cardiologist and having two other kids under four, I um, started manifesting this joint pain, um, which accelerated over a two-week period from me being a, a runner to sort of being immobile. I, I remember days where I, I just couldn't even climb up the steps. Um, so I got really sick um, and was given sort of a lot of, um, a lot of medications that gave me a lot of side effects, such as hair falling out, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. I remember people telling me uh, wow, you lost all your baby weight so fast. And uh, nah, that was because I just couldn't eat. So um, getting sick is a interesting thing. Um, when you, especially as a physician, I think you become, um, you know, the medications that you once prescribed to people and said, oh, you know, there's only a one in a thousand chance that you're going to have this problem. When you become the patient, you start realizing that you could be that one in a thousand. And so it started me on this path where I had a rheumatologist who told me that I will never be cured, uh, that I just need to get used to it. Uh, and this is just the way life is. Um, and so you get told that and anyone who's as stubborn as I am would say, well, wait, 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 there's gotta be more to this. There's gotta be more, lifestyle's gotta work. There's gotta be things you can do. And I met a neat person uh, who was a nutritionist named Karen Fick, who started me on this path to make me really think about how nutrition uh, and lifestyle, and not just nutrition, but Nutrition is a big component, but you know how stress impacts the body uh, and triggers inflammation, and how maybe if you can, if genes get turned on by um, inflammation, then there's a way to also suppress them. So on my own path to sort of getting better um, using these lifestyle techniques, uh, I told Jyothi that we got to write a book. Uh, about this because Jyothi has her own interest, and I'm sure she'll tell you in a second about her interest in uh, lifestyle-based medicine. And um, then we were off to the races. Yeah. So I I also had um, 23 years now in internal medicine practice where 
I began um, just so frustrated with the practice of medicine after we we both Monica and I both trained at a similar at the New England Medical Center in, in Boston um, separately, and we both came out thinking, you know, we are so equipped to deal with patients' illnesses. And I, when I became practice, when I started practicing internal medicine, I became so frustrated so easily about the little few little tools we had, and I felt like everything was always a band aid. And so we people really weren't healing. They were just, we were band-aiding it. And then we were giving a med, which caused another problem, which, you know, it just didn't see, it wasn't very satisfying at all. So I started searching for um, a path through integrative medicine. I became an acupuncturist. Um, I started learning about nutrition on my own because my patients who employed nutritional changes, lifestyle changes, and even with acupuncture started to get better. For example, if I was treating carpal tunnel with um, acupuncture, they were getting better with their sleep. They were feeling happier. You know, so I was like, what is this intervention that's causing so many positive changes? For example, a food plan that eliminates inflammatory foods can cause so many benefits in people, not just lowering their lipids or their cholesterol, so I think my journey has been trying to find these tools for my patients and myself to try to keep us kind of working optimally, trying to be as fit and well as we can without the use of multiple drugs all the time as my only intervention for patients. And I love my practice now because it involves a lot more um, incorporating education so that people can actually learn about how powerful it is, some of how these tools are so powerful, how we actually do have a lot of control over our health how it's not determined by our genes alone. And I think it's, a, it's very satisfying as a practitioner now to be able to let people know about these tools that we talk about in Body on Fire because it is something that is so, um, so potentially life altering. And uh, I think most people who have been on the journey with us and Monica can agree for her story as well, that there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of benefit that goes just beyond what we think might be cholesterol reduction or, you know, sugar reduction, blood pressure reduction, people just feel so much better. So it, is it true that without inflammation, disease cannot exist? I do think that most illnesses have a component of inflammation. I think most illnesses do. Yes. Um, Monica. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's true. So I think that Inflammation is a big umbrella term though. And so that's why I paused when you first asked the question because inflammation is a response of your immune system to, uh, to whatever trauma or something that affects it. And so you're always gonna trigger the, the inflammatory cascade when you stress out the body. And so any kind of illness that comes into your body or any virus is also gonna trigger those inflammatory, that inflammatory cascade most of the time our body can treat it quickly and that inflammation dies back down. It's times of chronic inflammation um, that sort of more of the chronic illnesses manifest. And so many habits of most Americans are, are they cause them to be chronically inflamed, right? You know, drinking alcohol, I would imagine, and smoking and not exercising and eating the standard American diet. These are all things that are inflammatory, right? That's exactly right. So one of the things that um, the way to think so we, you know, we always sort of think about this scale. We always we put this in the book, actually, and sort of say, okay, well, what are we doing wrong with our lives? And so in, in our lives, you know, the, the demands on our body, you know, things exactly like alcohol, but it's not that a little alcohol is a bad thing, but an excessive amount of alcohol coupled with um, all the salt in our diet. And again, not that, not that I believe that some salt is, in, is a bad thing, but our, you know, the average American, for instance, um, the maybe the goal of a sodium um, intake in your body could be from 1500 to 2000 milligrams of sodium would not be unreasonable, but certainly having, and remember every food, even a banana has sodium in it, but the average American has six grams, uh, you know, three to six grams of sodium in their diet. So it's an excessive amount of food. Then every, all of our foods are processed. And so you know, very few people are actually making food that's fresh. It's very interesting. You know, you talk to people and they'll say, well, I don't like to go to the grocery store. Uh, so I only go once every week or two. I'm like, wait, what? You know, so if you're going to the grocery store once, once every week or two, you're eating highly processed, frozen, oh, frozen's okay, but most of the time you're eating highly processed foods because the only way a food can last that long on your shelf is if it's got all sorts of preservatives in it. 
oils and sugars and it's just and so i think that people don't realize how much they're putting into their body that's um triggering that inflammation but then they don't realize how much their phone and you know one of the things that we always talk about is how much stimulation you get i mean just think about on a daily basis how many hours you use your phone how much social media takes up or people at night they say they can't sleep and they're not sleeping well because they're on their phone all night and the first thing people do, I always ask this question in clinic, what's the last thing you do before you go to bed? Oh, I check my email. What's the, th oh, I can't sleep at night though. What, what are you thinking about? Oh, I'm thinking about my email. Um, and then, you know, what do you do when you, if you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom? I check my email. What's the first thing you do in the morning? I check my email. I'm like, oh my God, you know, where they don't check their email or they do social media and the social media has become such a big thing. So all these things just cause your sympathetic tone, your, your fight or flight response to be high all the time. You know, we, we could, oh, did you want to say something, Dr. So I think the other scale that we talk about a lot is also the parasympathetic sympathetic issue, which is the sympathetic is your fight or flight and the parasympathetic is your rest and digest. And they actually can't be active at the same time. So when your sympathetic goes up with all the stressors that Monica just talked about, um, we actually lower our, G, our parasympathetic, which is our rest and, rest and digest system. And our immune system, which is so important right now, is in the digest part. So the rest and digest system, when it sinks like this, and we're on sympathetic overdrive, all of the issues that happen between these two levels going up and down is where all the symptoms are. And our goal with this book was really to empower people with tools to increase your parasympathetic, increase your rest and digest system, because that lowers inflammation by just reinforcing your parasympathetic. Terrific. So, you know, we could almost, every chapter of this book could almost be like an hour talk with either or both of you. So I, I just have some highlights, but first I want to uh, ask a question from Robin, who's watching live, because it's a good one. What are the best anti-inflammatory foods and what can we do to optimize being our healthiest so that we don't have inflammation? So that's a good question. I get that question a lot. So I appreciate the question. I think that um, before we talk about what is anti-inflammatory, which I think it's a little dangerous because there are lots of foods that um, could be considered anti-inflammatory. But I think the first thing you have to ask yourself is what are you doing that's inflammatory? So a lot of times the biggest thing you do is elimination rather than addition. So first thing is making sure that you're eating and uh, removing um, foods that are sort of highly processed, highly refined, uh, fried, try to avoid animal fats and animal products. Those things typically are, um, are considered inflammatory. And then when you're thinking about things that are anti-inflammatory, I, the biggest thing that I think is anti-inflammatory is just plants. And so you can't now people ask, well, what specifically, I get that a lot, what specifically in plants. And, you know, I sometimes give people a list, but I think that that's a little tricky because I just want everybody to eat loads and loads of plants. And so, and the people who tell me, I live in Florida and a lot of people tell me like, ma'am, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy. So I hear that quite a bit. I'm like, okay, well that's okay, but that isn't working for you. So, because you now have high blood pressure and I just had to put it, we had to put a stent in your heart and all those things that we've had to do as a cardiologist. And so that, that technique isn't really working for you. So let's talk about how we can change that. So things in sort of, even if I tell them to, let's start by cutting out your red meat and then adding in, okay, a lot of plants. So those people who do want a list, I would say I, things that I think are really, really good are the things that are really high in fiber and that are high in phytonutrients. So the very high in the green, the darker the green, the better, I always tell people. So kale, collard greens, um, mustard greens, turnip greens, those kind of things are very potent and high in phytonutrients. Also the berries, you know, and uh, blueberries and um, raspberries, also, you can't be, you forget the spices, you know, things like anti-inflammatory spices like turmeric, which is something that is like, I call that, even in the book, I call it my gold because I believe that turmeric is a potent anti-inflammatory. So I think the focus should be eliminating sort of all those pro-inflammatory foods and then also sort of bringing in as many greens as you can uh, is the key. I also, I also think that people focus on things like omega-3 fatty acids, for example, which are thought to be very anti-inflammatory. So 
things that have nuts, um, chia seeds, flax seeds, um, adding things that are uh, walnuts. Uh, nuts and seeds are very anti-inflammatory, just loaded and packed with nutrients. So at the end of the day, I think it's the phytonutrients, the nutrients we get from plants, the bright colors. We always talk about eat the rainbow. Don't just focus on the greens. Just, fo you know, it's all about all of the colors. And, um, you know, water, for example, instead of the beverages are also, when you eliminate things, you also want to eliminate the sodas and the juices that are loaded in sugar and add back water because that can actually be quite healing. Nice. So Susan sent in a question saying, have either of you doctors ever known of a patient who suffered a second heart attack after switching to a plant exclusive diet following the first heart attack? Sure. Absolutely. Um, so this, this, I get this question too, because patients walk in and they'll say um, they don't want, they, yeah. So the answer is yes. Um, the thing to remember about uh, diseases, you start building your heart disease from when you're a kid. And so and, um, there are cases of children who were five and six years old who had autopsies done because they died of leukemia that already developed fatty streaks of cholesterol in their heart. And if you look at 18 year olds that died in Korea and Vietnam, they already had plaque in their heart already at 18, 20 years old. And so what happens is, is that most of the time when we're seeing patients after they've had their first heart attack, they're in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, isn't it? And so at that point, there's already a huge amount of flat burden and a lot of heart. And so what ends up happening, so even though a plant-based diet is a great diet, one that I it doesn't always, it's not maybe enough, enough, there's not enough time to sort of um, reverse what's already happened with the sort of first 30, 40, 50, 60 years of the patient's life. So unfortunately that happens. And so I do believe that a combination of aggressive lifestyle and aggressive medications is the optimal plan in a patient who has had heart disease. I also think we can't minimize the role of the stress that it impacts on people, the role that meditation and yoga can play in reducing inflammatory markers and reducing risk for second heart attacks. There are some, there is some studies that show that meditation um, can also reduce that. So we do want to incorporate movement. We want to talk not just about the plant-based diet for reducing cardiovascular risk, but we also want to talk about the other things that are stress reduction, sleep promotion. When people aren't sleeping, if they have sleep apnea and they're ignoring other causes of inflammation for the body, that risk for heart attack is still there. So we need to kind of look at it as the whole body, big picture. Great, thank you. So one of the things I especially loved about the book is you guys both recommend yoga, pelvic floor yoga. Uh, and I, I'm a big, big fan of yoga. And that's not often the first thing that people suggest to people that are, are trying to you know, reduce inflammation or be healthy. So you wanna talk about why that's so important? That's the first one. Sure. So um, I have yoga mats actually in my clinic, um, and so we often are found in the hallways. People are laughing as we're walking by as I show people crazy yoga moves. It's kind of funny. So I think the thing about yoga is many things. Um, yoga is a combination of, of things and means different things to different people. And to some people, it's the um, they imagine these super athletic exercise fiends who can do crazy handstands and headstands. But I think we should shift away from that idea and really think of yoga as this umbrella term, which includes, um, it includes a component of meditation or relaxation. It includes strength building and flexibility, um, all of which are important. So yes, the poses are important because they all help with that. Now, I don't know if you, anyone who's ever tried yoga, what I, and this may be, because um, there's a lot of fear and anxiety about it, um, that we were going to expect people to do unreasonable things, but simple things like um, putting your, uh, trying to touch your toes could be a form of yoga uh, to start, um, or putting one leg up in like a tree pose, and so putting one leg up in the cross, and so that can be a type of yoga. And what you might find, because it's hard to do at the beginning, and I encourage everybody who's listening to just try that for a second. When you're doing that pose, you're not thinking about your target list. You're not thinking about your grocery list or what all the hundred things you have to do. And so what yoga ends up doing, because there's so much focus on that one activity, is that it focuses your mind as well. And so all that, that 
the mental noise that's happening in your head kind of goes away. Um, and so yoga has a sort of a, a multiple, has multiple benefits. And because you're focusing on one exercise, you're building strength, you're building core, and you're calming your mind sort of all at the same time. And it's really neat data out there on yoga and meditation in general, where yoga has been shown to you know, that sort of in mind body techniques in general. And it would be things like Qigong, uh, all of these Tai Chi have all lots of interesting data where they show where the studies show that blood pressure goes down, uh, people who lose weight, stress levels go down. Uh, and there's data where you have changes in your brain as well, um, um, which is amazing. Yeah, and I think as an internist, I'm always looking for ways to minimize the use of medications. And um, for me, yoga is that all encompassing, you know, do you want to feel better? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to have more mental capacity? Do you want to lower your blood pressure? It does all of it if you do it properly. And so especially for pelvic floor, both Monica and I have had three children, we kind of know there's like pelvic floor issues that come up and pelvic floor yoga is wonderful to kind of maintain that bladder control, the, the muscle mass, and even I do hormone replacement in my practice, but yoga actually has the capacity to maintain your muscle mass, which then in turn elevates hormones like DHEA in the body, which keeps you feeling vital, helps your muscles last longer when their muscle capacity is really our biggest um, kind of way to age well. The more muscle mass we have, the, the better our sugar does, the better our fat metabolism does and are better our hormones do. So um, trying to focus on things that build muscle in a different way, like yoga is, you know, I can go on for hours about yoga, but it's just such a great tool to incorporate for anything that's inflammatory for the body. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that because I'm a big fan of two types of yoga, especially yin and restorative. And I've been offering it free on this channel, bringing in extraordinary oh, yoga teachers. Awesome. And what's interesting is when we have doctors on or chefs, you know, we'll get up to a thousand people watching and the turnout for the free yoga classes is so low because I think that people don't believe that unless they're like really, you know, no pain, no gain, unless they're yeah. sweating profusely, that there's no benefit. But there is, there are, there is so much benefit to yoga. Yeah, it's uh, actually we, one of the... Sorry, yes. one of my when I I treat athletes, high level athletes, and sometimes when they incorporate yoga into their practice instead of a high intensity workout, instead of an aerobic workout, their performance starts to improve. Their lean body mass starts to go up, just be, and their balance starts to get better. Their reflexes start to get better because of things of adding the yoga part to it. So it is it is tremendously important for even you know an inactive person, especially, but also for a very active athlete. Great. Well, Monica, who's watching live, asked if there was benefits to fasting for people with inflammation, and you actually have an entire chapter on that. <laughs> it's interesting. I was supposed to talk at the ACC, which is our American College of Cardiology meeting in February on the benefits of intermittent fasting. So it was sort of perfect and needed to get into the chapter, into the book, and always a good question. So you know, um, so intermittent fasting is a, we never did that talk, by the way, because of COVID, uh, one of the crazy COVID problems. Um, so intermittent fasting uh, is kind of an, is an umbrella term as well, and sometimes refers to people who do sort of 24-hour fasts two or three times a week, um, and then the rest of the time they eat regularly, or it could be what we call time-restricted feeding, which is they only eat certain hours of the day. Um, and so um, I'm a big fan of time-restricted feeding. I think Jyoti does a little bit more of, you know, two days on of no feed eating, although I do that some as well. And so with my patients, I do a lot of time-restricted feeding where I don't allow, I tell them not to eat at least for 12 hours of the day. Um, and so often that's sort of 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., although I, I believe that people, as they get comfortable with the 12-hour fasting, then they can expand that and do 15, 16, and even 18-hour fasting. Um, and what, you, what we're finding, and you know, is in a lot of the studies are animal studies, unfortunately, um, and there are not a lot of human studies to show, but there's st studies that show not only do people lose a significant, they lose weight, but they're showing signs that there's decrease or almost like an immune system reset. So that inflammatory piece is the most interesting part to me. Um, and so uh, we do recommend it to our patients and believe that it, it has a benefit. Um, and there've been some big articles lately because it has become so exciting and popular in the communities uh, about intermittent fasting and a lot of support out there for it. Yeah, and I think it's also really, you know, the biggest things that we deal with that have very little treatment, for example, in Alzheimer's or 
memory loss, uh, cognitive decline, uh, fasting has become one of those tools we can use for people that actually can make a difference uh, in, in many things, even including an insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, um, decreasing abdominal size, you know, in terms of weight loss. So it's, it's a fat, fantastic tool to, that we have. And I, and, um, I have kind of migrated more into the time restricted feeding. I used to be someone who couldn't get a fasting blood draw because I couldn't imagine not having breakfast. And now I go 16 hours without eating and it's, it's, it's actually your body habituates and the, the brain capacity that changes and your energy that changes is pretty fabulous. And I think I, I really encourage people to try it. I would tell you after I do a 24 hour fast, I'm sorry, after I do a 24 hour fast, my husband says I come home like, uh, I come home with a kick in my step, um, which is so interesting, right? I hadn't eaten in 24 hours and I'm more energized those days sometimes than others. And so um, I, I think I agree with Jyoti, like just try it, just try it. Start out with, you know, like a 12 hour fast where you don't eat for 12 hours, but your body doesn't need that much food. And I think that's part of the problem because sometimes people say, well, I eat hundred percent plant-based and I still don't lose weight. Um, it's because so, so many people are eating so darn much, you know, and so we just need to cut back on, um, that food intake. And you have to remember that, like, even if you look at the Okinawans and a lot of the people in the blue zones who have the high, you know, Okinawans have the highest number of centenarians, they just don't eat that much. And so, um, their, their intake is, you know, they have their term for it. I'm forgetting the name for it right the second, but, um, where they don't believe in full satiety, like you don't eat till, but you feel like you want to unbuckle your pants. You eat till you feel like you've eaten and then you stop. And so I think time restricted and intermittent fasting, a lot of these fast, they kind of reset us and make us go back to that, to really listen to our bodies, to say, you know what, I'm actually not that hungry or I don't actually need that much food and um, which is neat. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I started doing intermittent fasting a long time ago, not because I even knew it was a thing is because when I got into yoga, which was August of 2011, the class that I really liked was at 11 and it went from 11 to 1230. And I found that even if I ate like a banana, I couldn't do the yoga. And so I just got in the habit of eating lunch, you know, around 1230 or one and it's stuck. And, you know, it's just, I think if, if people just sometimes just eat out of habit or I, I hear for, you know, fear that they won't have food and there will always be food. You, yeah. I, you know, if you skip a meal, there'll, there'll be food. I promise. There'll always be food. There's always be the food. other, the other issue that people eat is also not only social because many of our social events are around food, but also for stress, stress eating is very common. And so when people feel stress and anxiety, the first thing you think about is potato chips or, you know, something sweet, or, you know, it's just a reflex thing that we do. And sometimes we eat because we're bored. And I think a lot of people who are now stuck at home with the full pantry tend to, you know, walk around the house, they can't go to meetings anymore, they can't go any place, they kind of go downstairs, they just nibble, they're not really hungry, they're just nibbling, go into the pantry, and you know, that kind of have like not thinking about it. So one of the concepts is to be more mindful of why we are eating right now. Why are we choosing to go eat? Is it because I'm stressed? Is it because I'm bored? Do I really need to do that? And sometimes I just ask people, why don't you just go to the sink and get a glass of water and see if that satiates you so that you don't actually put in the calories that you don't need. Great. Okay. So I read, there was this one sentence in the book that blew me away and it's about exercise. And we know exercise is important, but I think sometimes it's harder to get people to exercise even than it is to eat right. But you said something to the effect of that not exercising can increase your risk of cancer. That's mind blowing. This is the book, but guys, by the way, and I'm posting the link to Amazon to get it. Are you going? No, go ahead. So, um, you know, in terms of exercise, I think that the thing to remember that um, most malignancies or cancers are associated with obesity. Um, and so part of the reason that we know that um, exercise is beneficial is because of the decrease in obesity. Um, and it, to remember, there's also a lot of conversation, like if there's somebody who's 120 pounds, five foot six and 120 pounds, and then there's somebody who's five foot six and 140 pounds who exercises and then five foot six person who's 120 pounds who doesn't exercise, who's is, who is healthier? And it's a person who exercises. And it has to do with so much because we are dilating blood vessels. Um, we're decreasing, we're keeping people, the goal is not to be obese, but just, you know, and not to be underweight or overweight to just be just right. Um, and to um, dilate blood vessels and uh, decrease inflammation, all of which happen when you exercise. 
Also in the realm of exercise, high intensity exercises can actually change the way we metabolize our estrogens. So for estrogen dependent cancers can actually, um, you can get rid of certain types of estrogen that are negative for our bodies by doing things like high intense aerobic activity. Uh, you can change your muscle mass, which also helps incorporate the way that we utilize um, our, our nutrients. But building more muscle mass, adding um, different intensity workouts can actually really help with some of those um, estrogen dependent cancers as well. Terrific. So where do you guys practice? What do you practice? And do you accept new patients? And if so, also, do you do telemedicine? So I practice at the University of Florida um, in Gainesville, Florida. Um, and so I, I have a catchment area um, of typically people from Georgia and Florida are coming to see us here in Gainesville, which is in North Central. Um, and so, uh, yes, and I'm a, I'm a cardiologist who does a lot of it. I do. I'm a preventative cardiologist who does advanced lipids. Um, and um, I take new patients. I have two separate clinics. I have a preventative clinic and a general clinic, both of which are fairly uh, mixed. But in my preventative clinic, I have a little bit more time for patient. So I'm really able to focus on some of these extra techniques that we like to do, like uh, nutrition and lifestyle, but, you know, some people, you know, and I always tell people just because you walk in the door thinking you're going to get a nutrition evaluation, don't think that that's how you're going to necessarily leave because, you know, every person comes in with a very different need. And sometimes the first visits, we talk about positivity and self-love. Other times we talk about stress reduction and meditation. And other times we talk about nutrition. So um, uh, yeah, that's what we do in, in my clinic. I practice in um, two places in Maryland and, and, um, Elkridge, as well as Mount Airy, Maryland, I have a functional medicine, internal medicine practice, primary care, but I also do functional medicine consultation. We incorporate um, testing, which looks at, you know, nutrition, uh, nutritional status, as well as stool. We look at the microbiome, we look at um, hormones, we look at a lot of the imbalances that are in the body that we can help correct. Our tools are also through um, things like uh, acupuncture, we do Reiki, we do energy medicine, we have sauna, we have different types of modalities. So it's kind of an integrative clinic. Um, yes, we are expect accepting new patients. Um, and we do offer more, we can do more of the traditional, but also the integrative functional medicine type internal medicines. I love that. So do either of you do telemedicine or do you have to live in the states that you guys practice in? So for us, um, it's, this is a little tricky. I think the telemedicine thing is not uh, perfect yet. Um, in order for us, we can, I think that we have to see patients. Um, we can, so I do do telemedicine, but I, they'd have to just check with their insurance and we'd have to check with insurance when people live significantly out of state to do that. And we also do telemedicine, but it's the, the state laws that dictate whether we can see someone from that particular state. Um, different states have different laws. Sometimes you have to see someone um, in that state with, you have to have a license in that state, even doing telemedicine. So uh, we are trying to get people to at least try to come to Maryland once so they can be established and then we can kind of practice where they live. Great, because I know we have people from Maryland watching because Sharon McRae says she misses you so much, Dr. Agarwal, and she looks forward to when you guys are going to speak for her group. So probably one of my favorite chapters in the book was the one on optimism. Yeah. And I, I don't really coach people anymore because I got so frustrated because I'd get these people, I would call them pitiful pearls, you know, no matter what you said to them, you know, head, I don't know, I'll try. It's so hard. They always looked at life. And I always wondered, I always asked Dr. Lyle, is that like a genetic thing? Whether we look at the glass as half full or half empty, but how, where health is concerned, is optimism something that you might want to work on a little bit? Go ahead, you start, Jyothi. So this was, a, this was a big passion of mine. Um, it was a more of a self journey. You know, I had, we had, about three years ago, I lost my father. It was a very traumatic year. I had multiple family members who were very, very ill, kind of all staying with me and I was responsible. It was very draining, very exhausting. And also um, with the loss of my dad at the end of the year, it was, um, to the point where I couldn't actually do any of the things that I knew would help me. It, you get to the point where you're just, um, didn't exercise, didn't meditate, didn't eat the way I probably should have. But I, and I started getting, um, a different focus in my mind that was very negative and I didn't understand why. And I started searching for answers and searching for non-pharmaceutical therapies sort of thing. And I, 
I stumbled into positive psychology through Sean Aker's videos and through the courses that they have at Harvard. And it transformed transformed my medical career, I think, because of the fact that I found it so powerful. I always knew that the mind-body was powerful because of meditation and changing the way um, we are kind of controlling our negative thoughts by maybe thinking positively. But the power of optimism, the power of knowing that things will get better, and the fact that it's not genetically predetermined blew me away. And so we, I, I felt compelled to put this in the, in the book because I feel like this is ultimately what drives people to doing the good habits that we're talking about in the book, because you have to have a mindset, I think, that's open and accepting because there's a lot of negativity out there right now in the world. There's a lot of negative things that are happening. People are losing their jobs, they're losing their insurance. There's a lot of fear out there. And what's going to get us through this, and my belief is that our hope and our that there's a higher power, there's a, there's something out there that's a little bit bigger than us. Also that things, we are in control, that we can look at things as we are going to get stronger because of this, as opposed to it's going to weigh us down. Because ultimately optimism has been shown in the literature to promote longevity, decrease heart disease, lower rates of depression, and also pick better lifestyle choices, which is ultimately what we want for our patients is to kind of, we can educate them, but we need to have them motivated enough to do the things that they, we know will help them and they know will help them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I, I give a questionnaire out in my clinic and uh, the last question is, are you happy? Um, and I will say nine out of 10 people will tell me they're not. And I think that that really makes me sad actually. And I think that um, I find sometimes I am unable to give people other tools to motivate them until I work on that one issue, which is, their feeling of hopefulness. And so much of the time, and you know, there are a lot of people, you know, Eckhart Tolle and Deepak Chopra and all there that are out there that are talking about how um, we focus so much on the past and so much on the future, but we forget to forget about the now and really focusing on what's happening in our day to day, understanding our bodies, trying to make every day better. Um, and so um, I think a lot of that stems from lack of self love. Um, and learning to sort of love who you are and love yourself, I think brings a lot of that positivity. And so I think really sometimes people, um, we start, you know, starting with a journal to ask yourself, what is it that you like about yourself or your life? And then reminding yourself of things that are good in your life sometimes helps people um, remember that life is actually pretty damn good. Well, the alternative is worse. My mother yes. used to say, the alternative. <laughs> you know, people, she, she suffered from a lot of chronic health problems, but always maintained her optimism and sense of humor. And, you know, she said, any day I'm above ground is a good day, you know? So yeah. I, I, I think I inherited that from her because I, you know, I remember when I was four years old, when my great grandmother had her leg amputated because of diabetes. And I, I honestly said, I wasn't saying this to be funny. I said, well, now you only have to shave one leg. I've always tried to, I mean, even this pandemic, this show was created out of optimism for thinking of something that I could do, you know? So I just, I don't know. I just, oh, that's great. you have, you always have such great energy. I've always enjoyed that about you. And I think that that is infectious and you should be proud of that. And I do think uh, we suffer from a lack of that as a society and, you know, the weight of the world has definitely the news coverage, you know, one of the things that I've stopped doing is watching the news. Um, Stop that. I've never watched the news. I'm 60 years old and I'm telling you the honest truth. I have never watched news in a day in my life ever. I can't, it's too sensitive. It, it is. And I think it just makes you think that the end of the world is coming every single day. You know, every hurricane is, is a, is the end of the world. Every snowstorm is a snowmageddon, you know, I mean, and so I think, um, and, you know, social media also purports that. And so I really, I, uh, I have to step away from it. Um, and again, it's back to that sympathetic and parasympathetic thing where all the time, all these things are just stimulating us all the time and they give us such negativity and we're not giving ourselves any time to recharge. We charge our phones, but we don't charge our bodies. So I love this on page 193 under triggering our fire, you write. There is also a link between negative emotions such as depression and increased inflammatory markers. That's like, that's unbelievable. Yeah. I think, I think that that's what people don't realize that there's so many things that we're doing to our bodies that, but and that 
healing the body is has to be sort of a collective thing. Like you can't just say, well, I'm going to eat better and that's it. Well, you know, you have to start learning to move more. You have to start calming your stress and you have to eat better all of it together, um, which is in, and, you know, sort of, I think that that, and then also remembering that, you know, your, your body is, is part of you and that you want to nurture it and you want to love it and you want to take care of it. I, I think these are super important concepts sometimes, uh, you know, in my clinic, there are a lot of tears, you know, and I think a lot of people are, there's a lot of sadness out there. And I think that that's okay. I appreciate that people are able to bring that to the table and, and, but I, and I think that there's some catharsis sometimes that happens by just talking about all the sadnesses in our lives and saying, okay, well, this is something that I have and these are our sadnesses and I'm going to put this in the box here right next to me and I'm going to close the box and you're not allowed to use that box until tomorrow and you can kind of think about that box tomorrow again, but for the rest of the day, you're not allowed to think about what's in that box um, and that sort of sort of channeling sort of that negativity into one place and then focusing on the positive, I think is really important. Yeah, there's a lot of negative thoughts that also result in higher cortisol, which can result in the inflammation. So what we are, you know, there's very little that we're in control of. Um, we're not in control of our genes. We're not in control of um, the hits that our environment triggers give us. Uh, sometimes we're not in control of whatever's happening in the world, but we are in control of our thoughts. So if we can start focusing on the things we are in control of and the power behind those thoughts, I think that is really, really helpful. And that again, increases that parasympathetic by lowering our cortisol surges, by lowering our inflammatory markers. And just, and, and you know, when we, and it's a positive spiral, it's either a downward spiral or it's a positive spiral. So when you start to make those changes, you know, things, things will happen. They kind of fall into place because we always get the question, well, there's so many options here. Where do we start? And I think where you start with our book is whatever speaks to you first. Like if you are someone who's already eating well, but not sleeping and stressed out of your mind, then maybe you start with those chapters that focus on those things. Yeah. Those are the ones I really like because I already got the diet and exercise down. It's the mind piece that I'm always wanting to improve. You know, I'm still not a meditator, but I do yoga every day. And it, I feel right. like that's a partly medit it's meditative. So I oh, feel absolutely. like I'm, yeah. So here's a question from Peggy, who's watching live. My husband has switched to a whole food plant-based SOS free diet in November. He has reversed his diabetes. However, he still has ED. And I, I'm assuming her ED is erectile dysfunction, not eating disorder. So is, is erectile dysfunction just like the ultimate inflammation? Erectile dysfunction is a, a um, vascular condition where there's not enough blood flow or inadequate blood flow to to cause the penis to rise. Um, and so um, a lot of people who have diabetes um, are going to suffer from erectile dysfunction and because it is a vascular condition. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's going to take time is the answer to that question. Um, and so in some people, yes, the, just the damage is too much and you may not get fully what you're looking for. Um, but most people I find, and sometimes actually that's how I get to my patients is to the men is if you eat better, you're going to have a better sex life. Um, and so, um, it will happen over time. And so it just, it's just, it takes more time. Like I appreciate that the diabetes is reversed, but there's still so much inflammation. And remember vascular disease is means that blood vessel, uh, disease of the blood vessels. And so there's the disease in the big, in the big vessels, we call that the epicardial in the heart or the, just the sort of in the vessel you can see, but there's also these tiny little vessels, which are called the microvascular. Um, vessels and those vessels get clogged first. And in diabetics, we see that those vessels get clogged first. And so, yeah, but they're also then the last to improve. So keep working on him, keep telling him to eat more plants. Those vasodilate dilatory benefits from eating all those plants is good. Keep him moving. All of those things are going to help him and it, it will happen. Also working on um, increasing those nitric oxide producing foods, the ones that dilate and, and, and nourish our endothelial health, the spe specifically the ones that are kale and bok choy and collard greens and beets. Those are very helpful to- I seem to remember we put, we put a, a picture of the nitric oxide producing foods in the book. And I was trying to think what page I could tell them, but I, it'll take a second to find, maybe I'll find it. But um, we do have, and we did write an article on um, uh, in what we can provide to you, um, to provide to you for your audiences that talks and has a bunch of the list of nitric, uh, nitrate, um, 
producing foods and really most of the dark green leafy vegetables you can imagine are high in greens, uh, high, in, high in nitrates. Please, just please email to me. I can always add it to the show notes. So yeah. here you have a chapter called oil change, and that has become very controversial because many of the younger plant-based doctors, including cardiologists are now saying, oh, oil's not so bad. Yeah. Dr. Esselstyn and Ornish, they're too old. They didn't read the data. It's, you know, it's okay. And I think people get very confused. Right. So I'm, I'm fully aware of the controversial topic you're referring to, unfortunately. Definitely right, and so I, I agree uh, that just recently happened. Um, so the so oil. So I think what we know, and you know, I've had this conversation with Essie as well, and I think what we do know that people eat an excess amount of oil in the United States and really in the world, and we're eating too much so too much oil in general. So. Um, remember that most vegetable oils are polyunsaturated fat, that olive oil has a little bit more monounsaturated fat, Co coconut oil is 90 over 90% saturated fat. And what we do know is that um, the saturated fat isn't something we do not want in our bodies. So even if it's from plant sources or animal sources, we don't want saturated fat. And the saturated fat data shows that when you eat saturated fats, you increase your LDL cholesterol, which is your bad cholesterol. So whatever you get, wherever you get those from, you want to keep those saturated fats down. Saturated fat more so than cholesterol. Remember cholesterol, yes, people make some cholesterol in their body and then there's certain cholesterol that you eat exogenously, meaning coming from outside that also can affect your cholesterol as well. But more, more importantly, probably is your saturated fat. So when you look at saturated fats like lard and other oils, those are things you definitely want to stay away from. And then when you shift away to that, then we move to remember, our, so this happened in the 1970s. So we said, oh my God, saturated fats are bad. And so stop, put away all your lard, go to unsaturated fats. Well, unsaturated fats don't have a very good shelf life. And so we, and so restaurants were really struggling because they couldn't make their food last. So then we, hide, we said, oh, well, let's just, we can fix this. So we fixed it by going to the chemistry lab and we started hydrogenating oils. So we brought about trans fats and trans fats are probably the worst oil we've ever brought into the system where they worsen HDL, um, worth increase LDL and decrease HDL and are very inflammatory and have been outlawed in most states in the, in the country right now. So that's the trans fat. So then we're back to saying, okay, we're back to saying no saturated fat, no trans fats. So now we're back to the unsaturated fats. And so when we're looking at unsaturated fat, we're looking at things like olive oil, which has more monounsaturated fat. And we're looking at polyunsaturated fats like in canola oil. And now, and now we break that down even further. And then your unsaturated fats are broken into um, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which are all in the polyunsaturated. So there are some benefits to some parts of polyunsaturated fats. And so, and then in the olive oil data from the Mediterranean study, in those patients, they were eating up to 36, 38 grams of olive oil per day. And in those patients, they, even in the most vegetarian of the group, they were still eating that much, a lot of oil, and they actually did very well. So the question, but then there are also other animal studies that have shown that if you eat any type of oil, you still build plaque in, with any type of oil. So I think what I usually tell my patients is that in general, we want to eat as little less oil as we can. Whether there's room for some oil and no oil, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think we know that. I think that we know that in general, we want to stay away from saturated fats, trans fats, and then a little bit of polyunsaturated fat or monounsaturated fat of oil in your life is probably okay for the average patient. But for patients who have advanced heart disease, I don't know if we know that answer. In fact, I have a research protocol out that I'm trying to answer that question because I don't think we have that answer yet. And so the reason that there's this uh, SC Ornish versus sort of the younger doc kind of controversy, it's not because anyone is wrong um, as much as we just don't know the answer yet. And so I think that the key is to remember that we don't want to we don't want to eat an excess amount of oil, but a little bit of polyunsaturated fat from your oil, maybe not so bad. But you should also remember that the calorie density of oil is extremely high, and there's almost 15, 16 grams of fat in one tablespoon of oil. And so people are putting in so much oil. And remember, anything even good oils are not good if you're eating a lot of them. 
So I think the bottom line is, is if I was maybe a little bit too verbose here, but just trying to say basically, try to stay away from all your saturated fats, including coconut oil, try to stay away from all your trans fats. And then if you're going to have any oils at all, uh, a little bit of unsat unsaturated fat through your oil is probably okay. I will tell you though, in general, in all of my cardiac patients, I try to eliminate almost all oil um, in my cardiac patients. Um, for, because I think that there's too much calorie density and too much fat, uh, fat that they're getting from it, um, from that. So that's the answer to that question. Well, you know, I mean, depending on who you talk to, you hear that over 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. And when I've interviewed Dr. Furman, he says it's really more like 90%. And all these doctors that are saying oil's okay, they've never been overweight. They've never been, been addicted to food. I, I have not, I've worked with like thousands of people and I have not seen anybody lose weight while including oils. Yeah. I think it's a misconception to say that oil is okay. Um, I think that people should understand what it is. And if they choose to use a little bit in their foods, well, they just need to understand that, yes, you're not going to lose weight if you're eating a high oil diet, that's for sure. Um, and I'm, I think that if you eat too much oil, for sure, you're going to have, um, I think that if you eat too much unsaturated fat through oil, that you are probably putting yourself at higher risk of heart disease. Um, but I think the data on whether there's some room for some wiggle room is not done. It's, not, it's just not there. I mean, I would much rather eat a whole food fat like a nut or a seed or an avocado than a fibrous, you know. Exactly. I mean, that's the point is that when I tell patients, like, why would you want to eat a tablespoon of oil that has 14 grams of fat? And actually, you're going to need like four tablespoons in order to get what you want, if that's what, or when you can fill yourself with nicely with an avocado or um, have a handful of nuts. And so uh, I'm a huge believer in that. Um, we use very little, if any, oil in our house. Um, and we eat a load of nuts and seeds and um, avocado. Great, thanks. So uh, a lot of you were saying, does making healthy lifestyle choices, ch uh, lifestyle changes influence our genetic expression? Our genetic, yes. Yeah. So there's a study that came out by Amit Kara, K-H-E-R-A, that looks at lifestyle versus genetics. It's a great study. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine. You might Google it. And what it shows is, is that more than that everybody, because everybody has a story that says, well, so-and-so eats this way and he's fine. Um, and so th there's a really nice graph in that, in that um, study. And then what he shows basically, she, do we have a second? I'll even share the screen. Um, do we have a second? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I just... Uh, I'm giving a talk to the um, ACC India today. So the American College of Cardiology of India, um, which is neat, there are 15,000 people coming on live for these talks at night to listen. It's really cool to kind of talk to, you know, people of my culture, which is kind of fun. Um, and um, uh, here's the slide. And I'll just show this slide here briefly. Just let me share it. getting a science talk here. So this is sort of a nice slide and basically talks about genetic predisposition and then heart disease. So if you look at people who are at low genetic risk here, uh, and if you look at a favorable lifestyle in the low genetic risk patients, that's the blue versus the red, you can see that in somebody who's genetically predisposed to better quote unquote genes for cholesterol, they're going to have, uh, their lifestyle has less of an impact. Whereas people who are at high genetic risk here um, on the right side, your lifestyle makes way more of a difference um, in those patients. And so I ultimately say, well, how do you know, people then ask, well, how do you know what your genetic risk is? Um, well, that's another uh, issue um, and something that we could talk about it would take a little bit more time to explain, uh, but there are genetic tests sometimes. And a lot of times we can tell by understanding people's family history um, and other, there's other testing we can do in a cardiology clinic. Hope that helps. There's Thank a lot you. of work that's being done in epigenetics, which is the that the role of our genes is not fixed. It is directly influenced by our lifestyle choices and maybe for future generations as well. So the science is coming out showing that there is a lot more control um, and our lifestyle choices matter greatly and our environmental exposures matter, matter greatly for our genes. 
one of the things you talk a lot about in your book, which I appreciate because it's often overlooked, is the importance of sleep. That's chapter 12, sleep on it. And so many people just, you know, they, you know, they, they start their day with uh, Starbucks and their day with a glass of wine. And, you know, they wonder, why don't I sleep well? Yeah, so the average um, um, American should, or the average adult, I should say, should sleep between seven and nine hours per night. And most Americans are sleeping much less with interruptions frequently, um, whether it be to urination or because of sleep apnea or difficulty falling asleep. Um, and so sleep is super important and restorative. I can't I emphasize, we can't emphasize that enough. Um, it's the time your body recharges. It's when your body, I mean, just think about when you're, when you stay up late over and over, when you were studying for a test, that's the time you get a cold. And so it's that time you're, you need that time for your body to restore. Um, and your point is important that AJ, that, you know, when you, um, you go, you wake up and you, you take a stimulant and then you go to bed and you take a little bit of a depressant. Like it just, it's your body needs to to learn, you need to listen to your body a lot more and allow it to follow the natural rhythm, the circadian rhythm. And when you're tired, you got to sleep. Also, there's so many medical illnesses that are, are high because of or issues that stay um, unresolved because of sleep mm-hmm. issues. So many people say, I can't lose any weight. I eat so well. You know, they're not sleeping. Your, your sugars are higher when you don't sleep. Your, your, your blood pressure is higher when you don't sleep. Your cortisol is higher when you don't sleep. And cortisol puts that fat right into your belly. So um, I think the sleep deprivation, and some people also have to know that it's not just about laying in bed, staring at the ceiling for eight hours. It's about restorative sleep. You have to go through the four stages. You have to go through REM. You have to do that multiple times cons- consecutively in order to wake up feeling refreshed and recharged. So I, yeah, we, I can't, I mean, both of us just incessantly talk about sleep because it's really hard to get people better on many fronts, medically speaking, sometimes if they're just not sleeping well. I find that, you know, and again, this might be a generality, but I have had thousands of clients, the ones that don't sleep well, they don't exercise. The people that really do at least an hour of some kind of vigorous exercise a day, more than walking, they have no trouble hitting the pillow. And haven't you noticed that the people who also don't sleep well, they're often, their moods are often more down, a little bit more dysthymic, a little bit more uh, lacking in sort of initiative and positivity. I, I certainly see that. Um, and um, so, yes, yeah, sleep is uh, important for mood. It's important for exercise ability, inflammation, weight loss. And I think the cortisol impo- argument um, is really important. If you don't sleep well, you know, you have these high levels of cortisol and remembering that if you don't sleep well, you just, um, the job of cortisol, I mean, there are many jobs of cortisol, but one of them is to bring fat to the center. Um, and so if you always have high cortisol level, it's true, you can't, it's very difficult to lose weight. And one last thing for sleep is memory loss. So I have a lot of people coming who are younger thinking they have Alzheimer's or dementia or things that are related to cognitive decline. And it's just about them not sleeping. So once you fix someone's sleep problem, the memory centers tend to get better as well. Nice. Thank you. So Elizabeth says, as we age, don't we need more sleep? I always hear that older people often need less sleep. Uh, both are, I think, um, not so the app, even as we get older, elderly patients need to still sleep about seven to nine hours. The problem isn't that elderly people need less sleep is that they think they need less sleep and they have more trouble sleeping, um, which is a problem. But as we age, we need about the same amount of sleep, which is seven to nine hours and getting adults to, or seniors to sleep, or as we age to sleep, um, is actually a challenge. Um, because they have so many things that happen at night. And so as a doctor, if you give a patient a diuretic, for instance, a medicine that makes you pee, you uh, are sabotaging their sleep, right? And so, or if you're not treating their sleep apnea, again, that goes with those big, a thicker neck or obesity, you know, if you're not treating those things, people aren't sleeping well, but seniors need the same amount of sleep uh, that our younger people need, again, not the youth, that's different who need to eat and sleep almost 10, nine to 11 hours, but in the young adult versus the older adult, the sleep amount that is needed is the same. It's just, it's harder to get seniors to sleep. It's yeah. also because their melatonin levels go down. Melatonin's our sleep hormone and it, and most hormones outside of um, cortisol and maybe insulin are decreased as we age and melatonin levels fall, which um, is harder and harder for people to fall asleep. So 
actively working on sleep promotion by uh, being out in the sunlight, exercising, you know, it becomes more and more important as we get older in order to maintain our circadian rhythm. Yeah, more, oh boy, th this sleep is really interesting to people because we get, we're getting more live questions on sleep than so far any of the other topics. So I'll just kind of read them all at once. Karen says, what is your sleep solution? Apple says, do you think magnesium, de magnesium depletion plays a part in sleep deprivation? And Angela says, is it okay to sleep half at night and half during the day? Does it have to be all at once? Can you make it up through naps? Uh, Joyce wants to I'll, know. I'll take on the magnesium question. Magnesium does 300 things in the body. It's supremely important nutrient. And one of the major things that it does is promote sleep. And most people who are have any level of stress um, are deficient in magnesium. And you can get magnesium through whole foods. You can get them through green leafy vegetables. But, you know, when we're drinking sodas, cashews, nuts, um, but when we are when we're drinking sodas and we're eating badly or not getting that absorption, we're also depleting ourselves. So magnesium is very helpful. I often start with Epsom salt soaks for people, where you can just soak your feet in in, in water or in a in a bucket. You don't even have to get into a tub. But that magnesium comes through the skin and the trace minerals goes through your body and it helps calm people calm down. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot some of the other questions, but I, I am a big proponent of magnesium my practice. Uh, the, the questions were, what is your sleep solution? Oh. Uh, do you have to sleep all at once or can you do half and half, make it up with naps? But I guess they're looking for a solution. Yeah. The thing is, is that um, sleep ideally is all at once. Uh, naps are, I'm a huge believer in naps. I love to take a nap. I know I've had a good day when I've had a nap at the same time. So, so naps for that recharge during the day are great, but in general, we still would want you to have um, that sort of continuous sleep and sort of the more data is on the continuous sleep rather than the interrupted sleep. Um, so we want you to sleep as continuously at once as you can uh, and really trying to promote those seven to nine hours all at once would be really uh, great and important. Uh, well, well, having a nap is sort of a, an aside and, and also important for recharge. Uh, what's our sleep solution? Uh, you know, I think that could be, I, I think that there's not one sleep solution for everyone. Um, I think that one of the things that we do tell people to do is not use electronics um, for the one hour before bed. Uh, there are a lot of people who say, well, I can't fall asleep without my television on. Uh, I just can't imagine how you, your sympathetic tone is like always up when you go to sleep with the TV on and wake up with that television on. And so um, one of the things that we do is that we always sort of talk about switching off all electronics one hour before bed. Um, don't, during the daytime, don't try to do, do stuff on the bed. Um, really have that bed be a place for you to uh, sleep. Um, and then, you know, don't do one of those things where you're watching television in the bed and then you're just falling asleep as well because those are sort of bad sleep habits. So one of the things to do then is to just switch off your electronics one hour before bed. Often I'll tell people to put on sort of relaxing music that sometimes helps. Um, sometimes showering at night is overstimulating and so you don't. You're freezing up a little bit, Dr. Agarwal. Still Dr. The other, has frozen. The other thing is um, cool, too close to bed and you certainly don't want to exercise too close to bed uh, because exercise. Cool, cool temperatures help. The cooler the temperature um, and also the, um, you know, it's uh, looking at your medications because sometimes medication side effects uh, and also taking caffeine. Some people think that stimulants in the afternoon shouldn't affect sleep, but the paradox of this is the more tired you are, the longer the caffeine may linger or the stimulant may linger in your system. So it's so hard to answer the question of what works because everybody's solution is dependent on why they're not sleeping in the first place. So kind of looking back to that. And if you guys want more on this subject, on October 23rd, we're having the plant-based sleep doctor from Cedar sinai Dr. Roy Artal, coming on the show. I think both of these doctors have been very generous with their time and answering questions. So if you want more information, I'm going to suggest you hop on over to Amazon right now and buy this incredible book. I've been posting the link this whole time. And if you guys really like these guys, I can't imagine you not. Maybe they'll come back separately and talk about their perspective on their own practices. And I know that Dr. Agarwal has an amazing story of recovery from rheumatoid arthritis that I'm sure you guys would like to hear as well. So thank you guys so much for your time and congratulations on the book. And I wish you every success with it. It's a great book and thank you for writing it. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. One of, and if anybody like reads it and likes it, please write us a review. We need a review. <laughs> Well, I think I can do that. So, so thank you. And thank all of you guys for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in two hours when I will be interviewing another wonderful plant-based doctor, Dr. Edwin McDonald on his book. Take care, everybody. Oh, nice. Bye.